Wow. And here we are, last the last uh, Sunday of December 2020. Frank, I am happy to say that. Um, and welcome to uh, Everyman BJJ Podcast. This is our regular time, uh, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern. Um, how are you doing over there, Frank? You know, as I was telling you, I told you to flip the switch because once you and I get going, <laughs> we, we just go. And, and, and again, we were talking about earlier, the reason, the main reason we started the podcast, unfortunately, is not to make a bunch of money, right? If I right. was smarter, maybe I would have made a bunch of money by now. But the main reason that we started the podcast is because whenever you and I get talking, we wind up talking for an hour, hour and a half. Sometimes if I'm there with you, two hours. And a lot of times good stuff pops up in there and we we never capture it like it's just it's it's not recorded so we just said well man we're going to be talking anyway and we're going to talk about this stuff anyway we might as well hit record create a library and then create a an umbrella where we can you know a lot of people can come under that tent and we can network and we can we can have conversations we can get feedback yada yada so here we are um, and I was telling you today, I went, I was talking to you earlier, Noah, I was up in the, in the Provo mountains here hiking for about two hours. It's probably about 30 degrees. I had a bunch of layers on, but I really, I realized I'm like, wow. Like, so this is the interesting thing. It's kind of like, you know, there's an old saying, an apple, an apple's not an apple an orange is an orange. Heracletes used to say, you can't step in the same river twice, right? It's the same river, but it's always a different river because the sun is different. The the season is different, the temperature is different, we're different, right? And so 30 degrees, when I went to Finland a couple of years ago, ADCC was held in Finland, I think it was 2018. And I was there with a couple of friends, Bobby Razik, the great filmmaker was there, Sean Rigo, my old friend from Robert Drysdale's great guy was there. And I was there, Mo, my man Mo, who, who's, uh, who's like the Joe Rogan of, of Abu Dhabi, um, who's, you know, the UFC commentator over there now for Fight Island was over there. We had a great time. We had a blast. And when I was there, there was one Sunday morning, I went out in Finland to a lake. There was a big lake there. And I was out there. I had the whole lake to myself at seven in the morning. It was so peaceful. There's all this green and, and, uh, and then there's the water and there's the sun coming up. And it was like 54 degrees. And I had a short sleeve shirt on and jeans and i was like this is the warmest 54 degrees like the most pleasant 54 degrees ever that i could ever recall in my life it might as well have been like 72 73. conversely i've been in san diego where it's always supposed to be right 70 and sunny and i've been there where you're close to the water and it's windy and you're cold you know and the, and the ocean's whipping up whipping up winds and everything so here in utah we're at 4, 000, I'm at 4,000 feet altitude, and I'm like, 30 degrees is no big whoop to go like hiking. A lot of people are, win are winter whips about it, but I'm like, it's no big deal. I walked for two hours, like it's no big deal. Like, you know, you just put on, on a hat and everything, and I, I could have taken some of those layers off. So in any event, you know that I do my shirtless shenanigans on my, on my Frank Forza Instagram page, my Facebook page, I do the whole, um, interesting thing, because you're, you're Mr. SEO. So Noah, for those who don't know it, Noah makes a lot of things go right with every man BJJ. And, you know, we're, we've got some much bigger plans. We're going to slowly, incrementally, we're going to build up this podcast. We're going to, we're going to add more goodies. We're thinking bigger and we're, we're going to, we're definitely going to add some new dimensions to the podcast in 2021, including like we've already been doing, Noah, we're going to have some, some, uh, some much bigger name guests. We're going to have a lot of big name guests in 2021. I can promise you that a big, a who's who of MMA and fighting and combat sports and jujitsu that's guaranteed. But Noah, you're Mr. SEO. You're always, you're always digging into the numbers. You were telling me you read 32, you've listened to 32 audiobooks in the last three months. You're, you're a tenacious white lifelong learner like tom d jarnett was telling us on the line podcast you and i have that in common we're tenaciously curious we're relentlessly curious i love how you get after but you're always the guy who 
once every man BJJ gets off the ground and we actually have a much bigger audience, you're the guy who loves to analyze those numbers even more than I do, the metrics, the data, who's watching, how long are they watching. And the interesting thing with that is that, man, I even lost, I just lost my train of thought. Um, gosh, what was I talking, what was I talking about before that? No, you know, I like to jump around. This is one of the great things about being able to jump around is I'm able to jump around and go, go, go. And one of the unfortunate things is sometimes you can become, you can lose your main, your, your main focus of thought. Um, yeah, well, we're, we're, we're talking about our plans and you're mentioning um, big names, but I also want to uh, uh, pepper this conversation with, um, or I should say season it with a little bit more of, of uh, what else we're doing. Um, not not just going for the big names, but also I would say, um, you know, there's um, I don't want to call it trend spotting, but um, we both have a knack for seeing things before, um, you know, before they hit the surface, and um, it seems like there's a little bit something there where uh, I want to say the influence of influencers. Or, yes. um, you know, there's a little bit of, um, you know, how something catches on. And, and, and there's a science around how something catches on. And that is, um, that's actually very fascinating, you know, to catch things. You know, like, um, I, had bought, I had bought Bitcoin um, on a riff um, when it was $4,000 uh, per coin. Um, I think it hit twenty seven thousand yesterday. Um, now I also sold it, but I sold it for other reasons, um, other than I didn't want to go long on it. Um, and you know, I was telling people, you know, Tesla, you know, Tesla was on the brink, um, and I'm no stock picker, but it just, you know, I looked at it and it just seemed right. And if we look at, I've been off the map for a while. I can't wait to get on, but. I'm going to, I'm going to say that this trend of us being isolated is is nothing more than like pulling a rubber band back and back in in a way in a way and that creative tension of people being on the mats and regularly mixing it up um, with this year of where where everyone's been more distilled they've been uh, cooking in their own juices and um, it's going to be a snap back into where everyone's energies going back to the mats. Um, I mean, three week, three months later, you know, we're going to see people walk around on crutches. You know, they went they went at it too hard. So I, I am the anti New Year's resolution kind of person because I, you know, um, let me know um, whenever. Well, let me know when it's St. Patrick's Day because all those people who make New Year's resolutions, you know. They hit a series of speed bumps, okay? It's like it's like a wave that comes to the shore, but it hits, it hits these barriers, okay? And these barriers, I'm talking about Super Bowl, boom, all right? They fall off the wagon. Some get back on, okay? Now, you know, not everyone gets back on, though. All right, we keep rolling along, boom, Valentine's Day. Oh, man, we lost a bunch of them there, you know? Some of them get back on. Uh, but wait, wait, here it comes, St. Patrick's Day blow out all right after about saint patrick's you go back into any gym where are the new year's resolutionaries you know they're not there they're not there they've blown up you know so i want to say you're, that you're right though the, the most motivated people are not the type of people that say well when the first of the year rolls around i'm going to do x y and z the, the, the most highly motivated get things done people are People that just make a decision and they get going right now. They, they, they dive in like we dove in with this. I mean, we didn't, you know, we, we didn't have everything super well organized. We weren't rolling over in a bunch of money. Right. We just made a decision. Someone was asking me the other day on my Instagram, I was talking about some nutrition stuff. And he said, well, where do you start? And he wanted to hear me say something nutritional. And mm. I said, I just wrote the word desire. <laughs> you start, you start with desire. You start with a committed decision. That's where you start. That's the first mover. 
Mm -hmm. And by the way, going back to what you said earlier about us, our goal, our aim is to be the influencer of influencers. We want to be, we imagine, I mean, that's what, that's what my ethos personally is. I'm a, I'm a super creative person. I may put, put me in a cave and I'll come up, I'll generate the ideas. I'll generate the phrases. I'll, I'll generate the wordplay. I'll connect the dots. I don't need to be in this echo chamber regurgitation nation of what is everyone else doing? We want to strive to do it better. We want the influencers to look to us and say, what are they doing? How can we do more of what they're doing? They're, they're doing stuff that not many people are doing or that no one's doing. My friend, Luis, Luis Oliveira, who is Brazilian, who runs Samba Latte coffee houses there in Vegas. You know that, I mean, and Samba Latte is like, you know, probably the preeminent coffee experience in Las Vegas. I think they've got four or five coffee houses. Luis always has people banging on his door saying, can you start a coffee house in our state? Right. He says no to most of them because it, he wouldn't if he gets too big too fast then he won't have the control. He won't have the quality of the experience that's so important to him. So he's very meticulous about, you know, he's like, Frank, I want to be the Neiman Marcus. I only want 30 or 50 of these nationwide. I don't want there to be 500 of these. because yeah, You don't want to be Neiman quality. Marcus right now, though. Yeah. They went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. But but he, he, Lewis always says, we're not, he said to me, we, we interviewed him, said, and, and by the way, if you love coffee, you should listen, you should go read my story on medium.com about Lewis, Lewis Oliveira, the coffee king, Sambalante Coffee Houses, which were voted one of the 50 best coffee houses in America, by the way. Um, but he, he said, we don't follow the trends here. We set the trends. We don't, we're not, we don't follow trends. We set trends. That's what. That's very important to me, Noah, you know me. That's what we want to do here. We, we don't, ju when we do have guests on, we don't want to just have guests on, Noah, you know this. We want to have the best interviews, the best revelation, the best details, the best questions, the best conversations. Every interview, I send people out there, all interviews, all conversations, all podcasts are not going to be created equal. There's going to be a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy of conversations. When you, when you, I've been doing this 27 years as a journalist for the Salt Lake Tribune, for the, for the Las Vegas Review Journal, for Fox 5 News. I worked with Ultimate Fighting Championship, Globe Trot, and traveled around the world with them, worked with Dana White. I've interviewed Gorbachev. I've interviewed Hillary Clinton. I've interviewed Sylvester Stallone. I've interviewed prison inmates in the prison. I've interviewed mothers whose kids died on the battlefield overseas. I've interviewed every, every stretch. I've interviewed billionaires. I've been all the way across there, elite athletes. So I've been down this rabbit hole 27 years. We're doing this because this is what you and I do anyway, Noah. We love having these conversations. We're intellectually curious. We find value in them. And now we're thinking, hey, if we hit record, if we press that red button and we record, a lot of other people can benefit from this. And we're not here to just do a damn podcast. You know I'm not interested in that. We're here. We're going to do it. We're going to try to do it exceptional. We're going to roll out better presentation in 2021. We're going to have better guests. You and I might start doing two a week instead of one a week. We did one a week here in 2020. We might do go up to two, two a week here, maybe. We're probably going to increase the presentation. We're getting some new equipment. We're going to get new mics. We're going to, we're going to do it bigger and better. And I'll say this to people out there. When we interview people, when we conversate with them, those will be top 1% interviews. So just make a note of that. All podcasts are not created equal. All interviewers are not created equal. All conversations are not created equal. We're looking to do this at the highest of the high. And that's why we think that we're, that's our goal. Our goal is to be the influencers of influencers. That's, that is the goal. And that's realistic if we do what we're capable of. Definitely. I'm sorry to brag a little bit, but I want to give people a window into the psyche of a champion. That's how champions think. Champions aren't into playing small. If you're if you're playing small out there, if your dream doesn't scare you a little bit, then you're you got the wrong dreams. You're chasing up. You're you're trying to climb the wrong mountains. It should scare you a little bit. You should have big goals. You know this. This is just how I think. I just I'm not saying it to brag. I'm saying it because it's how I think. These are the conversations we have, Noah. If we're gonna sit here and play small ball, 
I have no interest. Let's we, we, play big. Let's let's do the best interviews out there. Let's do the best conversations out there. Well, we were having, you know, we, we just kept falling into these conversations on, you know, after, after we were training and, um, you know, just getting back to that. And we said, well, let's just, you know, let's just go ahead and get started now, like doing, you know, doing a podcast with them. And the only thing that to this point that I've noticed, um, well, there's a few things, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm only, the only thing that I want to highlight here is um, there's more, um, whatever you, whenever you, sit down and we talk like this and we have these conversations um now there's lit there's more intention involved uh, but i am also uh less uh less fearful to be authentic you know um so um i i'm not the type to engage in um you know um over the top or or uh, you know that's just my humble roots of uh growing up um you know, I we we say with the you know seeking to be the best, um, but I will also balance that with um, you know we're the kind of crew that uh, we grow, you know, and then we kind of outgrow what we have. Um, you know where you let, let me the analogy I can think of is you know where we 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 have a plot of land and we're farmers and and we have some livestock and we will use every inch you know in the beginning it starts out with a little plot okay and then as we start to understand we're like well we'll take a little of this we'll take a little more and we'll start to grow and, and utilize every square inch of arable space we may grow up too you know we, we may we'll take this vertical as well mm -hmm. um but you know, we, we, we start with humble beginnings. And so, you know, what you're saying, uh, you know, I want to balance that with, um, you know, that's our objective. And that, you know, right now we're still taking over. We're just taking over real estate. It's easy to go right. It's easy to go swipe up. It's easy to go swipe a card and buy that equipment and put that in place. It's easy to do that. It's hard. It's hard to develop uh, years in the making. Uh, with experience it's hard to hone the skills of conversation and have that dialectical um, um, relationship where we where we um, consider each other's points and and we think a few chess moves ahead uh, to to um, to what we're talking about I wanted to bring up the topic of the chess um, no, wait, 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 wait. Oh. Wait, wait. Before that, we talked about something earlier that it's a great story. No one else has probably ever told this story, and I want to tell it. And it relates to UFC and Zufa. Zufa were the, you know, basically the Fertitta brothers, along with Dana White, who were oh. sort of the, the, the brain trust that put UFC on the map, along with the blood, sweat, and tears of the fighters. Um, but you know, you and I, so what Noah is emphasizing here is, hey, we're trying to build the right way. We're coming out of the gate. We don't have a lot of followers. We're not blowing through money. We're not spending a lot of money. But what we are doing, Noah, is we're in the trenches and we're getting better at learning to be a team. We're getting better at and one of the subplots of this whole Everyman BJJ thing is like you said, you weren't always comfortable in the public eye. You weren't always comfortable in this kind of setting where we're going to hit record and there's a microphone and it's and 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 everybody could be watching. That was that was new for you. So there was a lot. There was a lot of no one needs to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You stepped out of your comfort zone there. That was a big step for you. So mm -hmm. we're doing this yeah. the right way in that we're not just throwing money at it. We are. We are building more organically, more authentically. And as we grow and as we attract more followers, more watchers, we will commensurately put more financial resources. As we attract sponsors, we will put more fun. We're not going to put the, the cart in front of the horse. When that reminds me of what I was talking to you earlier, when I worked for uh, Zufa, when I worked at Ultimate Fighting Championship and I worked with the Fertitta brothers. 
we were in this small nondescript building, 2960 West Sahara Avenue there in Las Vegas, across from Powell Station, which the Fertitta's dad, that was like the flagship casino for their dad, who was a great man. And we stayed in that building even once the UFC was making a lot of money and selling a lot of pay-per-views. They had done some renovations to that kind of a rinky-dink building. Rinky-dink for a professional sports franchise that was that big, that was doing shows that were broadcast across the world, a professional sports organization that along with boxing are the kings of pay-per-view. If you went in the building for a couple of years there, you were like, wait, there's the building has to be better than this. There has to be more than this. There have to be more bells and whistles. This doesn't look grand enough for the UFC. You'd be disappointed. So they did some renovations there, but eventually they were, they were getting so big and they were making so much money that the building didn't really look the part. You were like, huh? I'm expecting the building to be more glamorous, to just be more odd, uh, just, just to be more awesome. And what I thought, this was my interpretation along the lines of what you and I were talking about, building responsibly, building organically, not building too fast, right? Building the right way. What I learned was the Fertitta brothers who are billionaires in two different industries, right? They've got the casino industry. They've probably got other holdings, real estate holdings, et cetera. They've got, they've got a venture capital arm, and then they've got the money they made from UFC. These are very, very smart seasoned business people. And the one thing, one of many things I took away from them is like my junior MBA, my unofficial MBA degree there was they build very responsibly. They don't just go and throw, if the money's not there, they don't throw money at it. They don't, they, you know, they, they like to, okay, when we're making enough money to do that, let's do that. Now, I mean, you're a billionaire. You could just say, well, we want that now. But they were looking at the numbers like, well, the numbers don't justify it. The numbers for this, for our, for what we're doing UFC wise, don't justify it. We're not there yet. Let's not just throw money at it. So what you said, it echoes what I saw on the front lines in the trenches when I worked for, for I worked for six years watching the, you know, the Zufa and Dana and the Fertitas and their lawyers and many other people working together and the fighters working together to say, how do we bake this cake? How do we bake it? So when you said that earlier today, it it totally rang that bell of, oh yeah, 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 you're right, Noah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the, the chess, uh, talk, talk about chess for a few minutes because, um, and you know, chess is having a, uh, uh, chess is having a renaissance moment. Um, you know, it's one of these everlasting, type of activities, his passions, his pursuits, um, that uh, it rises to the level of, you know, nations, you know, it's a national pride, it's an ego thing. But um, um, it, it, it's interesting, and I don't know how it changes you on uh, neurologically, uh, but it's got to have the same effect as what it's like to live in New York City. And let me explain why I'm saying that, okay? Um, you know, I guess if you play chess, you're constantly, you know, well, if I move this here, you're going to move this. So you have all these options, you know, you're looking at this optionality and then, um, for, uh, second, third and fourth order, uh, consequences of your, of your actions. Uh, when you, when you live in New York city, um, let's say you want to go grocery shopping and, um, you might want to stop and, uh, get a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Um, in outside uh, of, of these uh, hyper congested areas, um, you would jump in a car and you would drive over to a shoe store, buy the shoes, put them in the trunk, um, uh, and then go grocery shopping. You put your groceries in the in the trunk. You drive home, and uh, you know unless you're living in an apartment building um, with an elevator or something that of that sort. Uh, you know, you drive into your garage, you you unload your car that way. It doesn't work like that in New York City, okay? Well, uh, like, uh, well, I live in New York, and um, I'll take the A or the C uh, to Columbus Circle, two stops away, and, um, you know, it's a white card, hop in. Um, it's, it's a 20-minute walk, 15, 20-minute walk if I want to do that. But you don't always want to do that for various reasons. Um so I'll go up there and uh, grab your groceries. You're gonna have to take those groceries back home. 
uh, you know, uh, or you're going to be carrying those everywhere with you. Now, you have to plan several steps ahead before you make your move, you know, before you leave the door. Uh, you know, when I, um, in my first 10 years yeah, living you, there. You can't, you can't run, you can't go to work, go home, go somewhere else, go home, go wherever, go home. What you could do where I am here in Utah, but what you're, Utah, you're in, in New York, once you leave home, you're coming back home later and that's it. So everything you need to do needs to be done in between them. You can't be going here, going home, go, you can't do that. You don't have that luxury. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. And, and, and the apartment I'm, I, uh, that I have in New York is a, a, a fifth floor walk up. So uh, you're, you're huffing the stairs up and down, you know, um, with what you got. And, and that gets old if you want to, like what you say, you know, if you want to go out for these individual individual sorties and come back. Uh, so you'll leave home, um, you know, like, like if when you I'm, you got to pack, you got to pack wisely when you put that, when you load your bag in the morning, you it's gotta strategic. Wisely. You got to have the gi. You got to have everything in that bag. Oh, let, let me, let, hold Let me interrupt that. You don't, you know, the, if, if you want a good smelling gi, you're going to need to check into a laundry service. Like what Henzo has 60 bucks a month for you laundry don't service. Care, you don't care your, but that's a unique feature of New York because most places don't do that. There's a couple of places in California, you, but 99% of gyms don't do that. But that's how distinct and unique New York, New York is. But if you, that, that's because of most, most uh, apartments in New York do not have, um, they don't have a washer and dryer in, in the apartment. Yeah. Vast majority, okay? Secondly, if you're gonna do your laundry, um, um, you know, and if you're, if you take out the time to do that, you're going to need to go to the lawn, you know, where there's laundry. Sometimes, sometimes if you live in a very large building, there's a, there's a laundry, uh, on, in the basement. Okay. So you go down there with your card and you have to load it with some funds on it. And then, you know, you have to stake out a spot to wash your laundry. And by the way, you're schlepping your, uh, uh, laundry detergent and and your little grant you know little granny grocery cart full of laundry around now that's if you're going to do laundry that day if you have a ghee smelly old ghee you, you know and you know there's some guys who are like yeah i train two three times a day in the same ghee too i bet uh because they're not you know they don't have that uh, wherewithal to go and wash geese every night uh like that and you can't hang it out in the in a balcony you know in brazil you, with geese if they're not washing your ghee that day you're hanging out in the balcony and let the sun dry it out which that gets a little funky and i'll talk about that another time um but so you can see how i mean you're carrying that you, if you're going to go to work okay let's let, let's just lay this out you go to work and you want to lift weights too all right you want to lift weights maybe you want to lift weights in the morning you can go to work, so you have a change of clothes for your work clothes. Don't forget your shoes. Don't forget your socks. Don't forget your belt. You know, uh, you're gonna take a lock. You can go to the locker room, take your chances at the gym where you work out at. All right, pack your stuff in that bag. Have another part of your bag full of jujitsu gear, because you because at Henzo's, um, you can, you've got to bring your own towel, your own soap. Flip flops are mandatory. Um, your, uh, um, uh, what, I forgot the name of it, you know, your, your, your tights underneath, um, your shorts. And, um, I always train with a, uh, with a shirt. I know some guys have to do that bare chest thing. Um, but if you're, if you're going to be a time efficient human being, if you're going to, to master your own productivity. You, you're going to have to get a pretty damn big bag in 2021. I would say people watching it, you're going to need a big bag because like what you're talking about, you've got a computer in there, you've got your gi, you've got your, if you go to the gym, and by the way, no. Two bags, by the way, there, two bags. Huh? That's right. two bags plus a I've coat. Two bags. Yes. Plus a coat. So you're looking at it, plus you know how, you know how I do things. So I'm all, I always have food stashes with me. I always have an emergency food stash because if I don't have that food stash, 
then I'm vulnerable. Then I'm like, well, I need something quick. My, my, my hunger alarm sounds. And that's how people wind up eating fast food because they don't, you know, there's nothing around them and they've got to be quick. And then they wind up in a, in a fast food line somewhere. So mm -hmm. I like to, to bring a big stash of food as well. So you imagine those two bags, you got computer, you got change of clothes for the gym, you got a gi or whatever in there for that. You've got, um, you know, you might have a food stash. I always have a binder with me, like a notepad with me. And so, it, it, and, and otherwise you're gonna be, you're going to, you know, you, like again, you can't be going, coming and going to, to back and forth to home. So that's you just that's gotta, out of the way, yeah. You gotta get good at, you know, you think about even the military or hunters, people who are hunters or military, they usually have 40, 50, 60 pounds of something. Some of those military have 80 pounds of mm -hmm. stuff. Just, and that's how they can, they can handle any situation that crops up. They got 70, 80 pounds of stuff at all time and, 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 and weapons. And I think that any serious person in 2021 who wants to be a high performer, who wants to be efficient, especially if they're training martial arts, you need these two bags ready to rock and roll in the morning. And by the way, you did remind me of something. If you're doing tournaments out there for people that are going to do tournaments, I recommend tournaments for wrestlers, jujitsu players, etc., because they force you to get even better. I mean, you're you're going to your 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 IQ is going to go up even more when you know that there's going to be a final exam, when you know it's going to be public, when you know you're going to go there and there's going to be really good opponents. Something about that experience, that date on your calendar, knowing this tournament makes you have to absorb better it makes you prepare better it makes the it makes the material you know you just wind up sponging even more information and if you're doing if you i was thinking this if you're doing tournaments you almost definitely have to be training twice a day at least five days a week whether that twice a day is jujitsu mm. wrestling etc but it could be like a morning jog and then jujitsu at night it could be lifting weights in the day and then jujitsu at night. It could be jujitsu in the morning, jujitsu at night, whatever. You, I mean, the best, the elite, there are elite people out there doing three, four sessions a day, but you're gonna at least be, if you are if you wanna be competitive at, you know, some of the major and then whatever's right below major tournaments out there, if you wanna be competitive, you're looking at probably at least three hours of your day minimum of training of some sort. It could be swimming, it could be sprints, it could be running a hill, combined with your jujitsu practices, your wrestling, your yoga. You could easily fill three to four hours a day. Um, and that's what that's what you're looking at. If you want to break into the to the good, to really good and aim for great on the mats at tournaments, I mean you're looking at a minimum of three to four hours a day, at least five days a week, probably six days a week. It's 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 a major commitment. Frank, I got more. I, 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 I held back a little bit on you. Okay. I got more, okay? So I, I'm gonna just wanna continue this example to show you like this is like an every man situation. And this is this gets it this gets at a lot of what I'm talking about, why I wanted to have this podcast. Because I needed to I wanna flesh out all this detail to you, you know, so that you can hear it. Cause you know, you trained me, you're, you're one of my coaches, but I want you to just to understand levels here. Okay. So when I'm in, I'm in New York, uh, so, you know, I gotta go to work and I have all that, uh, I have all that gear. Okay. I, yeah. Training twice a day. Henzo's is open early in the mornings. It's open at night. And so that's two geese right there. Okay. That's two geese that you use up, but they have laundry service there. So you just, after you're done, you just drop it right there in the barrel and um, they, they have machines. They do it all. They do it all there and it's hanging there. My geese, my geese are hanging up at Henzo's right now. I've got like four of them. They're all hanging there, all unused, waiting for me to come home, waiting for me to put them back on. Um, oh, you know, of course you got your belt you got to carry with you. But I want to tell you after, after training. Okay. So, um, so after you train at night, like I like to go in there, um, you know, there's a, a 6 p.m. to 7.30 and the 7.30 to 9 class, okay? And um, Lewis, who, uh, who mops the floor, he mops the floor every night, you know, all three levels. You know, there's that half mezzanine floor, and then you have the ground floor with the Muay Thai, and then downstairs, you've got two different areas. One area is for the white belt class, 
and the other is for the big blue basement area. Anyways, he, he's up there cleaning all that. So you want to get out of there because he still is going to go back there into the locker rooms and clean out, clean those too. You want to get out of there so Lewis can go home that night, all right? He's a purple belt, by the way. He's a wonderful person. Um, um, so I know he's been affected through all this. I have been wondering about him. I hope he's been doing well. Um, so after you get through training, all right, you get up, you, you climb yourself off the mat, and you got to get off the mat because, uh, you know, as I said, Lewis needs to clean up and go home too. Um, and so you got to stretch out, you know, we, we're not going to, you can't stretch out there. You need to get off that mat and go shower up, you shower up. You put on your civilian clothes. I don't like to put on my work clothes after a training jits. You know, I like to put on civilian clothes. So, and I'm hungry at that point. I'm hungry and it's 930, 945. I'm walking out of there. Um, you know, cause there's sometimes there's a line for the shower and, you know, I do get in maybe a few, a few minutes in like a five minute roll or 10 minute roll after class. Um, but after all that, you get all your bags. Well, you, you want to eat and you want to eat right then. You, you need to eat something. You, you know, cause you skip dinner, your dinner, you know, now that's dinner. Um, uh, and we're talking, it's nine 45 and you got to be up in the morning, up and rolling again, up and moving. So sometimes, um, I would cab it over to lifetime sky, Manhattan, go up there, check in, I would shower or I would actually, I always shower before I leave Henzo's. Okay. But I get over there. And I'll shower again, just because it's like you just you're still sweating after that monster sweat, that monster sweat you have after rolling. I'll, I'll shower again, and then I'll go upstairs because the that that place won't close till eleven or or midnight, and that's when I get my my foam rolling in. I'll get my stretching in. They have a cafe that closes at ten, so I might get a bite to eat, but you don't want to eat too much there. You know, the food gets kind of old. Um, so instead, I'll jet over i just walked a few blocks over to whole foods and they're closing down the steam bar at night and you're craving food man you're craving those carbs and you just get whatever is left over you know at the end of the day and then after that and, and there's no place to eat there so you gotta take it home so i'll take it so i'll walk over the subway or i can walk home that's another 30 minute walk i'm rolling into the apartment it's 10 15 10 30 and it's just the sweetest thing ever. You just drop into bed. You're like, I have nothing left into me, except I know I'm supposed to prep for tomorrow, get all my stuff lined up, get it ready to go again. And I got to watch some moves on YouTube. That's the grind. And, and you know, I'm working, you know, uh, 45, 50 hours. 55 hours a week. Um, and uh, that's real, Frank. That is real. That's the grind. And I am not the only one there like that. You know, there are guys in there who do this three, four times a week. And you feel it in your body. You start to feel like a six week old bumblebee or a honeybee. You know, honeybees only last, they only live about six, seven, eight weeks. But you're on that, you know, after a few weeks, you look like that, that honeybee that's got, had to work out flying around. It's got part of a wing it's starting to, you know, not fly right. You're, you're starting to get a little messed up. I feel like that sometimes after, after a couple months, um, I dropped 20 pounds. Um, after two months, you drop 20 pounds, that kind of, that kind of approach doing it. Cause you just, it's that pace. It's just that pace. And come Saturday or Sunday, forget lifting weights. Forget it. My joints are swollen, bruised. You know, they're, you know those deep internal bruises you have. But I know I need to lift weights. I just don't have it in me. My body's drained. So I'm sharing all this with you because you have a lot of knowledge about the fight sports. You have a lot of knowledge about seeing these things. That's kind of, you know, I'm laying the I'm laying the groundwork of explaining this situation. Okay, because you know, with, with a, with, I'm over, I'm past, I'm to the right of forty five. Okay, in fact, I'm 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 very I'm I'm close to fifty years old, and I'm not on anything. 
I'm not taking anything. And it is, it is, uh, it is a death march um, in, in well, some I, ways, I the, the energy about, level. I, I was talking about, you know, we, we mentioned earlier Heraclitus. This, this, stain, this, this kind of mentality has been around for thousands of years. You can't step in the same river twice, mm -hmm. right? And when people really understand that on a metaphysical level, on a deeply philosophical level, what it means is our bodies are always changing. People out there that are in their 20s may, might see me train sometimes and be like, bro, you don't work out that hard, right? But my thing to them is, be, hey, you're going to be 40 one day. Come see me when you're 40. You're going to be 50 one day. Come see me when you're 50. I used to tell Drysdale that, you know, like I'm, I'm giving everything. I, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm being serious. Like when I was on the mats for many years, man, there were not, I mean, there were not many people that were a harder worker, man. There, there it just, I was in that crop of whoever you were going to point at and say hardest worker in the room, you were going to point at me. You were going to point at me and maybe you have a couple other people, but I didn't let people outwork me. But, what happens is age, you know, father time does kick in and you can't go. I come from a wrestling background in, in, in high school where, you know, and then I went to college to wrestle, had my co collegiate wrestling career ended by a major surgery, 27 inch scar. But that wrestling mentality is just like hard every time. There's no flow gear. There's no let's flow. There's no, well, I'll put myself in bad positions and then see if I can Houdini my way out. It's like, no, I'm going to try to be the hammer every second, every minute, and I'm here to dominate. And if I don't go all out, I feel lazy. I feel ugly, right? So that's a very wrestling. And so when you get older, you know, you're just, you, you still have that mentality of, man, just, let's, just, let's just shark tank it every round. And then you realize, well, if I shark tank it every round, you know, I, by the end of the week, I'm going to, you know, my, I'm going to be, I, I'm going to increase my risk of injury, right? I'm going to overtrain. I'm going, you know, whatever. I mean, it's, a, it, there's a point of dimin diminishing return, right? There's a point at which more is less and less is more. There's always a balance, right? Especially when, like you said, on top of our training, we've got work demands. Not only do we have work, so you could have 40, 50, 55 hours of work. But some of that work can be very stressful. And that stress is an, another demand on your body that can, you know, that, that can drain you, that can zap you, that can zap your central nervous system. And once you overtrain, once you over, when you start to hit a cycle of overtraining, you know what happens to your resting heart rate? It's higher. That means the, the heart is working harder. You know what happens to your central nervous system? It's fried. That can take, that can take weeks or months to come back. You know what happens to your your ligaments your tendons way and your muscles way more susceptible to tears and injury now you know what happens to your immune system weaken so now you're more likely to get sick so you know now your now your, your immune system is tied to your hormones too now your hormones can be out of your testosterone and everything else serotonin can be out of whack so we are a whole body so everything is connected to everything everything matters so to balance it like you said one of the key things to balance it i used to think man Let's just come in every day. I started jujitsu when I was about 30 years old, so relatively late in the game. And it was easy there for a while. It was, let's just train as hard as we can. Let's just give everything. Great. And then as you get older, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, it's like, wait, I'm not recovering like I used to. When I get injured, it takes me two to three times as long to heal now. I'm not using steroids. I'm not using human growth hormone. I'm not using you know, TRT, testosterone replacement therapy. If other people are, I have no problem with that. I have no problem if that's their thing. If they're competitive athletes, I might have a problem with it. But I don't have a big problem. I'm not going to sit here and worry about that. I'm saying my ethos, my code is that I don't do that stuff. So I don't have any, I don't have any special magic pill to help me recover. So what I found, Noah, that did help me recover is I went predominantly plant-based. For a couple of years, I went exclusively plant-based. I don't like to use the word vegan or vegetarian because I think that there's a lot of holier, there's a lot of judgment and holier than thou and I'm better than you and look down on you that's, that's happened with that. And there's a lot of judgment 
And also, I think a lot of vegan and vegetarian diets are not necessarily any healthier. I think a lot of people pervert that and, and they're, not, they're, they're vegan and they're, and they're not, they're eating vegan donuts and vegan crackers and they're not even healthy vegan, you know, so, so, and, and vegan beer. And, and so I'm not saying that I'm just saying, as you get older, as you go more plant-based, my experience and the scientific literature suggested as well is that your recovery will go up. So not your cardio recovery and also your muscular recovery. I have way, way less soreness now going the more that I work plant-based in there. I didn't say exclusively plant-based. People can find their own their own level of that. But the more that you work that in, it's there's very strong indication that your recovery is going to go up. The other thing I did is on the ego level, you know, I, you know, I, and I, I'm not shy about this. I did a TEDx on it. You know, I've had a sizable ego relative to me, me being a competitor, relative to me grappling, me writing. I'm not hyper ultra competitive at most things, but I am ultra competitive creatively as a writer, as a, as an athlete, I'm very, very competitive. And so I'm, and I'm competitive even in training, right? I'm, I'm super competitive even in training. I don't like to lose. I'm not saying this is the best. I'm just making, I'm talking about my truth. I'm not saying this is the best approach. But so I had to sit down and because I was so competitive, I had to say, Frank, you can't fight tooth and nail and for every, for every round and every second of every round now. You don't have that to do that every single day, six days a week, twice a, twice a day. You don't have it in you. So I had to develop more of a flow gear or I had to develop where I would pick my partners. I'd pick lighter partners sometimes. Sometimes I might even roll, I might have a couple of hard rolls, then I'd roll with some of the women who didn't put as much strain on my body. They were really good. Michelle Nicolini, multiple time world champion. Tammy Musumeci, world champion. Sometimes I would train with, you know, I'd be like, look, my muscles are feeling it from yesterday. So I might pick someone like that who's got phenomenal technique, but I'm not going to have to put out the horsepower, right? I'm not going to use all my power. So, I, so it's really knowing as you get older. Now, everybody, a blue belt might not have the same luxury. Me being a black belt and being in Las Vegas where I know Evan Dunham. Evan Dunham and I are friends. You know, Robert Drysdale, Mikey Musumeci. I'm friends with a lot of people. So if I take a round off or I pick somebody who might be an easier round, they're not mad at me because they're thinking Frank's already paid his dues. He has the right, you know, he's been doing this a long time. They're okay with it. Well, if you're an older athlete and you're a blue belt, you might not have the same luxury to pick your partners. That, that kind of sucks in a way, right? Because, because your, your coach is just saying you're going to go with whoever. And if it's a 230 pound gorilla, then you're going with a 230 pound gorilla. And if it's all out, it's all out. I had the luxury as I got older, to feel my body that day and say, you know what, Frank, going pedal to the metal is not going to work today. Look around the room. Who can you train with and get good trains, but maybe get a medium level role, not, 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 not a shark tank. So these, now that was hard for me, Noel, because my ego wanted to go hard every day. I find going very hard, very gratifying. I find the wars where the wars where you have to, you have to check yourself and you're like, wait, we're really getting after it. You know, I had a guy, a Navy SEAL friend I used to train with at, at Drysdale's one of them. I mean, it was so much Tasmanian. He's getting me, I'm getting him. He's trying to break me. This the Navy SEALs, they don't stop, right? Like, and, and, and you get, you train with someone like that. And it's like, it's enjoyable. When you're done that role, you're like, wait, bro, we got after it there. And you knuckle like dude, <clears throat> we got after it. We, we had to dig deep. I love those roles. My ego loves those roles, but the reality is at some point we all have to wake up and say, wait, can I be that guy, that shark tank, that let's pedal to the metal. Can I be that guy day in, day? I can't. I had to, I had to look at myself and be honest and say, okay, well, how can you make it work? What, you know, what, what, what kind of roles can you get that are flow roles or what kind of partners can you pick that are going to help you grow your game? but it's not always rock versus rock. It's not always two rocks colliding. So this is something people have to think of themselves. You have to look around your room and realize like, maybe maybe if you're a bigger guy, maybe you can handle the abuse better. I'm 140 pounds. So maybe if I was 220, maybe my philosophy might not work. Wait, I, 
I, I can I can I stop you there right there on that yeah. one? You know, I have feelings too. <laughs> I have feelings too. Um, yeah. You know, just because it's a bigger guy doesn't mean um, it's just the the movement is just different. Okay, the movement is different. The physics are different. There's more there's more consequence with with leverage, and so um, you know, no, I let me let me just kind of also balance what you're saying from a blue but let me you know i'll say as the blue belt on the podcast um and, and and very very junior uh to it um i have a i have my own operating code about uh, my own operating system you know my default setting my default setting is i will roll with anyone in the room who who asked me to roll with them um i will roll with anyone in the room um at all times um i don't hold back the only the only caveat to that is if someone smells awful okay or or i suspect that they have some kind of um wound that i don't want infected by uh you know that's that being said um i know i don't take rounds off um I don't take I don't take any rounds off. Um, I am there to train. I'm there to get my money's worth. Uh, but I don't I don't employ the same wrestler strategy that you do. I am employing the hey I'm an office worker here visiting, you know, it, with my family here, and um, I'm here to roll. Now there are a couple of my friends, you know, where they're like. Give me what you got. What you got today? You know those kind of those kind of roles are fun because you know you open it up. You open it up uh, to roll with them because you're trying to get them. You know this is a little ego. It's a, there's a little ego. Uh, ego and I'm talking about ego with the lowercase e. It's an ego battle between you and your friend. I'm not talking the ego with capital E, which is like the psychological thing. By, by I'm the talking way, irony is e ego is pervasive in, in jujitsu and combat. Like people act like like everybody's out there on their podcast acting like nobody. They all most of these guys, all, all almost all the great ones have humongous egos. I don't care what they say. What mm -hmm. bullshit! Like the big ego is very epidemic in our profession. We are at least aware of it, and we do try to control it, and we do try to be nice, and we do try to be respectful, and most people are. But this notion that you're going to go into a jiu-jitsu academy or an MMA academy and there's no egos is the complete – it's it's total BS. I don't know why people are, are acting like that. Like, there's tons of egos. They are, they are pretty well-managed. Fortunately, they are well-managed. But they're massive egos, and they're just very – very um pleasantly disguised they're very you know yeah. they're behind being nice they're behind formality um don't make me have to become investigator big ego mr big ego investigator and show, show the hypocrisy <laughs> of of my brothers and sisters in this sport they're massive egos yeah. if if you don't have a big ego then don't charge anybody anything don't enter a tournament don't try to win gold medals don't ask, you know, the UFC for more money, whatever. I mean, you know, don't, don't drive a really nice car, you know, get, get out of here. Like, yeah. you're, you're, you know, if you're, if you're an elite competitor, go watch Marcelo Garcia. Remember those Marcelo Garcia, um, you know, he, the beauty of Marcelo Garcia is he was, he was putting a camera in his gym before almost anybody, right? There were very few people that were putting a camera and it was like, here's Marcelo rolling with whoever, people who came from overseas, and you've got like him, watch him and Rafael Lovato. Lovato, you know, they're being nice at fur, whatever. Watch when Lovato's trying to pour it on Marcelo. Watch the reaction. That's the elite, that's that's the, and, and I love Marcelo, and he's this humble little, hi, I love Marcelo. We're gonna have Marcelo on this podcast one day. I love him, and I love it. And when you see when he turns it up against Rafael Lovato, well, like, oh, we're gonna turn it up. We're going to crank it up. You can see that competitive fire of like, oh, no, it's it's you. It's your turn. No, no, no. It's my time. This is my match. This is my match, buddy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, you can disguise it 
when you're when you're so much better than someone you can disguise it when you get to someone that's just as good that pushes those buttons that's pushing you that's threatening to take what's yours that good old ego that competitive fire comes out bro so well for everybody I, out there i don't i don't want to hear it like the, the egos exist in our ecosystem just as just as abundantly as any ecosystem we do do a good job of trying to manage it, of being aware of it, of trying to be nice, of trying to make our partners better. We do, we, we do do a lot of good things right. In fact, it's amazing that we're as nice as we are for all of the alphas we squeeze into a room. For all of the alphas and high testosterone, ultra competitive types that we squeeze in the room, it's amazing that we're as nice and as polite and as giving and as generous to each other as we are because there's, you go to Henzo Gracie's, you go to some of the classes, bro, there's a lot of, there's probably more alphas per square foot there than almost anywhere else in New York City at that time, right? So, uh, well, well, you, uh, any event. Yeah, you know, I, I'm just, you know, you can just think the most humblest, uh, you know, non-athlete um, there at the academy, and they might, they're a superstar attorney, or... Um, Dr. Grip, uh, who's an anesthesiologist, um, you know, I talk, I, we, we call him Dr. Grip. Um, uh, you know, and, and we're not, you're not dealing with, you know, you're, you're someone who's not, um, not a non achiever. You know, the, the, the folks there are outstanding, um, you know, in the top of their class in their respective pursuits, um, their, their vocational pursuits. And, um, you know, that comes out, of course, and you get close to them. You, you get, you build bonds. Um, my buddy uh, that, um, uh, who's smaller than I am, and um, he's, he's shorter and he's also just smaller. And he's, uh, he used to serve in the Israeli de Defense Forces. Um, and um, I don't, I'm gonna pick on him and say, I don't know if he learned anything. Um, but, um, I was, you know, roll with him and sometimes he's like, come on, you know, I'm like, all right, <laughs> you know, but you know, even with that, I don't want to hurt him. You know, I, I, I hurt him, but you know, we'll, I'll, I'll move a little faster. I'll lean a little more. Um, you know, I'll put my weight, I'll, 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 I'll pressure pass or something. And, um, but I don't want to hurt him. Okay. Well, um, last year, um, this person um, um, had a knee surgery. Uh, uh, he had a, a full tear, a uh, uh, full ACL tear. And um, I was gonna, I was boarding a flight that afternoon to fly back to Vegas uh, for the, for um, uh, Christmas uh, break, Christmas and New Year's break. And um, he's a father of two young boys and his um, the wife hadn't got to see him while he was in the hospital. And, um, you know, I, my bags, I got my backpack and I got my go bag. And, um, you know, I, I, oh, you're at the hospital still. And, um, you know, I, I was on my way to the airport. And I'm like, I'm coming to see you, you know, because he had just told me that he just told me, I don't know, we're like, yeah, I got my knee, I got, just had my knee operation. Like he didn't tell me in advance, but you know, I mean, I'm like, all right, I'm on my way. And was, you know, I'm, I had to think, okay, how am I going to do this again? Let me go back to New York logistics. Okay. New York logistics. You've got to have, you've got to have a plan. That's why chess is so important because chess teaches you strategy. Chess teaches you that you need to think third, second, third and fourth order ramifications of your actions. Um, so I, took a cab over, which is further away from the airport. I went and, and it was up on the Upper East Side uh, where the hospital is, far on like First Avenue, um, way, you know, it was a 20 minute cab ride, you know, um, on a Saturday, you know, midday, which is a calm time. And um, I got there and checked in and, uh, you know, oh my God, my buddy, you know, he's, he's in the hospital. And then he tells me that um, he had been in a hospital for a couple of days and even his wife hadn't got to see him, you know, because she's had to watch after the children. And, um, 
you know, I said, you know, I said, well, I'm gonna have to go in a minute. You know, I just want to stop by high and by, you know, you know, um, bump, slap and instead of roll, go. Is it no, no, hey, hey, I'm gonna order you the Uber. You know, stay here, stay here, you know, if you know, if you want, stay here with me extra 15 minutes, I'll order you Uber and you just take an Uber from, from here to the airport. And this lovely person, um, uh, you know, he just needs some company for a few minutes. And, um, you know, I stay with him and um, we hung out a little bit. And, and you know, he's like, man, don't worry about this. Your friends look out after you. And it felt good. You know, it felt, it was, I was like, oh man, you know, it, it, it it really feels good, you know, to have friends um, who are there for you. You know, it's good to have friends that they're going through their life and you can jump in and help them too. And you can't build those relationships like lifting weights. You, you know, oh, no, just the, 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 that, you know, that level, that level of, of seeing and I, you know, I can tell you other things that this, you know, as an example of this person, uh, of the things they've done. Um, well, no, the, 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 there's a lot of beauty in, in the mats. The there's a lot of beauty in the mats. It's beauty there. It's, it's a lot of good people. Yeah. The, Sorry. The beauty I got a little of, wrapped the, up there. The beauty of this ecosystem is that there's not a lot of pretension. Okay. No. The world out there has a lot of smoke and mirrors, and there's a lot of pretension, and there's a lot of BS. And the beauty of this ecosystem with the mats is there's not a lot of that. That gets mm -hmm. weeded out. You're either going to be real or you're going to get devoured. You're going to go away, and you're not going to come back. Okay? Yeah. So that's number one. The bonding is second to none. I mean, I guess the only place I can think where you would do better bonding would be a war zone somewhere where you, where you, your, your, your fate, life and death is tied. You know, I'm your protector. I've got your back. You've got my back. These are bonding environments, right? Like no other fast friends, fast friends made very quickly. Law I enforcement, wanna, I say this. law enforcement I wanna, too. Yeah. I want to say this about the ACL. Let me cover a few bases here. So the ACL, okay. Um, I did a story on Dom Cruz for Bleacher Report. Bleacher Report's one of the top 10 sports websites in the world. And we did a, an in-depth story on Dom Cruz, Dominic Cruz, UFC champion, who had three torn ACLs. Uh, it's called Give In to Win. Gee, I don't, I don't like the headline. Someone else wrote the headline. I don't like it. But the story is a good story. And it illuminates Dom Cruz's how did he have the three completely torn ACLs, which were career-threatening, how did he come back, do the impossible, and win a UFC title? So read that for anybody out there who's either dealing with a serious knee injury or any injury that sidelines you that sucks. Read that story. There's a lot of Dom Cruz in that story. There's some of Frank Forza in that story, too, because I've been down an injury rabbit hole. So, by the way, if you want a window into a psyche of overcoming and being injured and coming back and redemption. You want a window into that? You want a window into supreme mental toughness? Read that story. Frank, you know, Frank, uh, Frank, it's, it's, it's about Dominic Cruz, Bleacher Report, give in to win, Frank Carreri, Forza, punch all that in, and that comes up. Now, let's talk about this notion, though, of anytime, anywhere, any place. Like, right, like Frank, Frank being on the mat and saying, hey, I take on all comers. It doesn't matter. All comers bring it every day. The reality is, if I took that mentality every day, I can't. I can't train at that level. The, the, the cold hard reality is that in a good academy, right, in a high level academy where there's a lot of tournament competitors, I cannot go in with that mindset of like, hey, all comers every day. That's just not going to happen. That's there's a heightened risk of injury for me. And I, I say this, Noah, I think I've said this to you. I've said it to Jordan Worth, our good friend who's a brown belt with 10th Planet. And I've said this to many young students. Um, and this is a Forza-ism. This is my own quote. Nobody else. I coined this phrase. Nobody else. You get injured, as wonderful as your teammates are, no, I have yet to see anybody volunteer to pay another person's medical bill in this sport. I've never seen it. I've never seen 
someone injure someone. Now, nobody is out to hurt anyone on the mat. I have, it's very rare when someone would try to intentionally hurt someone at a reputable school or academy. That's very rare. The vast majority of people, they may be trying to dominate you. They may be trying to tap you five, 10 times in a row, but they're not trying to hurt you. Hardly anybody, very rarely run into someone who wants to send you to the emergency room. But when you do get hurt, right? And you know, the environment's just really intense. Nobody's coming to pay your medical bill. Usually, God bless you, Noah, for going to see your friend in the hospital. A lot of, a lot of people don't. Most, train, most teammates aren't coming to visit you in the hospital even. I, I, that's even rare. Okay? It does happen. Um, I remember an old black belt instructor of mine before Robert, Mika, Amik, uh, Emil Carsipoli, who's in Las Vegas, Team, team Mika. He's a uh, Hoyler Gracie affiliate. Good guy. I like Mika. Mika and I were good friends. We've had many deep conversations. We had a friend who was suicidal, a black belt who was suicidal. We went to visit him in the hospital. A lot of people didn't. We went to visit him. You know, he had drug problems or whatever. We went to visit him. We were like almost like an intervention. Our friend didn't make it, unfortunately. Our friend didn't make it. I know other black belts who didn't make it, who succumbed, who've, who died, who committed suicide. My old friend, Robert Fallis. We, people can still have their demons in, in, in this mat, and sometimes they don't always get the help they want, and they can feel alone, even in this environment. It's a great environment, but just remember, I haven't seen anybody who's coming to pay your medical bill. So at the end of the day, you are responsible. Your body is your investment. You are responsible for that investment. Even your coach, even though you should honor and, and, and respect your coach, your coach is not going to pay your medical bill. When your coach puts you with the 300 pound gorilla, your coach is not paying your medical bill. Your coach will say, oops, sorry. And he might go talk to the 300 pounder about being, not being so, so rough next time, but he's not going to pay your nice of a great of a guy as your instructor might be. He's not paying your medical bill. He's not going to be there the two months, the three months when you can't train as much as you want. And when you're injured and when you have, you have to go to work and you, you know, you don't have full use of your arm or whatever. Like, so these are real life things. So we've got to think at the end of the day, this is a know thyself world, know thyself. And, and you have to be responsible. This is your investment. You're responsible for making sure you're healthy, making sure your body performs. You're responsible for yourself planning for when your body's 50, 60, 70, 80, and the mileage and the abuse you put on that. So I've taken control of my health now where, I absolutely 100% pick my roles now. But guess what? I didn't do that for many years. Mm -hmm. There was a period of my life where if, and I mean, even going back to teenage years, where it was, if you want to rodeo and you want to get down, we can do that. Maybe you kick my butt, but we can, we can find that out. We can test that theory. There was, there was a yeah. time of my life. But what I'm saying is, you can only burn the candle at both ends for so long. Dan Gable, right? Dan Gable, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. 15 national titles at Iowa. A guy I interviewed for two and a half hours one time for a magazine story. Dan Gable, age 46, had a full hip replacement. He was, as far wow. as wrestling goes, 46, full hip replacement. Had to retire early from coaching. Had to retire early because he couldn't show the moves anymore. He was in so much pain. Dan Gable still rolled after his hip replacement. Guess what? He picked his roles and he only had very few partners. He needed people that worked with him. The best, the best we'd ever seen at that point in wrestling had to pick his roles and had a few training partners. Couldn't, couldn't wrestle. So my point is you only have so many blows in the body. It can only take so much. And I've got 30 some years of carnage and kicks and blows. And, and so at this point, at some point, we have to pay the piper and say, you know, we heard Tom say, Tom trained some jiu-jitsu. Someone hurt his neck. Lorenzo Fertitta, my old boss, great guy. I trained jiu-jitsu. Someone hurt his neck. Pretty good in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Right? In training. Well, then, it, uh, when go you're ahead. At that, Sorry. When you're at that level, when you're at that level and you're getting hurt and you've got money, right? You know, you've got to be in meetings and all. So at some point, at some point, being healthy does matter, and we've got to make intelligent decisions, and that is different for everyone. I'm not saying that everyone out there can do what Frank does at my age 
and pick their roles because maybe they haven't paid their dues. Maybe they haven't earned the right to pick their roles, right? Maybe they're in an environment where they can't do that. There are other factors. My point is to the extent that you can do it, to the extent that you can do it, when you know your body and you know what you need that day, do it. I mean, if you feel like, hey, I'd rather have some flow rolls or whatever or not. If, you, if you're in an environment where you can do that, then listen to your body and do it. The same as if I went to the gym, you know, I go to the gym tomorrow, I'm gonna listen to my body. If I'm, if I'm doing, if I put 45 pounds around my waist, which I do, and I do pull-ups, and my body is fighting me on that sixth or seventh pull-up, I'm not gonna be like, I have to do 10. I'm not going to be dumb. You're not going to go CrossFit bicep. style. You're not yeah, going to go CrossFit I'm, I'm style. Not be, so that that was my only point. One, one final okay. thing. Okay. Leo be Leo. Be, oh, by, by the way, for chess. So Tom D. Jarnett, who we just had on our podcast last, you know, earlier this week, great guest. You know, commanding yeah. officer, of Na Navy SEAL, uh, Navy SEAL Team One, just a phenomenal guy, a, a great leader. And Tom had mentioned that one of the commonalities among SEALs is that it seems like a lot of them play chess. They play chess right? and, they're, and they're great. They're not just great athletes. They're not just mentally tough, but they're problem solvers. He says, Navy SEALs are elite problem solvers. Tom D. Jarnett told us, I'll put Navy SEAL problem solving up against anybody. They solve problems. And they happen to be a lot of them chess players, including Tom. When the, the, the biggest chess player I ever met in, in Jiu Jitsu was Fredson Pichal. Fredson Pichal, for those who don't know him, you don't hear his name a lot, um, fought in the WEC, right? Uh, was, a, was a black world world champion. But Fredson Pichal has the distinction of being one of the few people on the planet in the history of jiu-jitsu who went straight from purple belt to black belt. Fredson Pichal skipped brown belt. He, he, he was, as a purple belt, he was beating all the black belts and he was tapping them. So his, Osvaldo Alves, I believe, was his coach. Osvaldo Alves is the same coach of, of Sergio Pena. Osvaldo Alves was a very smart guy in Brazil. And, he, and his, some of his prized protégés were Fred Pichal, Sergio Pena. And Osvaldo Alves was like, you know, you talk about making do with the resources you have, not making excuses. They had a gym about probably about the size of this room. So they put like 20, 25 guys in a little gym the size of this room and they put a mat in there and they would, and they were killing each other. They were, he had, he had phenomenal drills and, and he produced. So French and Pichal went straight from purple to black. Sergio Pena, who gave Hicks and Gracie the toughest, you know, match in competition he ever had and almost beat. Remember, we're going to have Sergio Pena on, by the way, Sergio Pena was beating Hickson like, a, I think it was 11 to nothing. 11 to nothing late in the match and he could have stalled like the last minute sergio could have stalled the last minute and he said that's not who i am that's not who osvaldo alves that's not the way we fight and sergio pena kept going for the kill and and fred Pichal caught him toward the end of the match and beat him but sergio pena if he wanted to run out the clock as they say right if he wanted to do that probably wins that match and that would have been huge and probably a lot more people would have learned Sergio Pena. But anyway, my point is, Fred Pichal, big time, that guy had his chessboard wherever he'd go. He always had a chessboard with him. And the final thing I want to say on chess, because this is the way that I think it. As someone who's coached kids, I've coached kids in wrestling. I've coached all ages in jiu-jitsu. And the one thing I would tell the parents about kids, that's what I would say. Listen, you bring a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old into the academy. And if you try to teach them to think five steps ahead, 15 steps ahead, and you try to verbalize that or whatever, it's too complicated. No, no little kid can follow that. They can't follow, hey, let me verbally tell you how to think 15 steps ahead. But if you teach them jujitsu, you are naturally and, and you are naturally and organically teaching that kid to think three steps ahead, four steps ahead, five steps ahead, 10 steps ahead without the kid even knowing it inadvertently that kid is learning a chess game a strategy game to think multiple steps ahead and that is one of the best gifts that you can give a kid because as you and i talk about with the purpose of this podcast it's not just jujitsu for the mats 
It's jujitsu for life. And one of the things you take that carries over to life is the mental toughness, is the confidence, is the chess game, is this chess strategy. Thinking five steps ahead, 10 steps ahead. If you're Mikey Musumeci, 50 steps ahead, right? That's the beauty of this sport. And for people out there saying, why should I put my kid in jujitsu? All these other podcasting podcasters are saying what I already knew, eight, you know, 19, almost 20 years ago when I started, when nobody wanted, when hardly anybody wanted to train, when we we're all crazy. I got it. I knew it. And I've been thinking this for a long time. I've been thinking it before your podcaster was on, was on their podcast telling it. But I'm here to say it to you again, Noah, as you said, we are teaching these kids to play checkers, to play chess, not checkers. We're teaching them. And if they get really good, like a Mikey Musumeci or a Leo Vieira or a Hickson Gracie, then we're teaching them to play grandmaster speed chess and not just checkers. Yeah, well, there's a, actually, you know, there's a world, um, I, I, I don't know um, what the, there's a grand champion chess, there's a chess master who went and got his uh, black belt in Marcel. Uh, under Marcel. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, it, um, uh, Wa, not Wozniak, Wozik, I think is his name, yeah. something like that. Um, and he has a great book out. I, I've got to go listen to that book again. But um, uh, and he's a very private person. But I want to say there is another, you know, I said that, that the two types of people that I won't you know, seek out to roll with. There's a third one, and that's the brute. And what I mean by the brute, I mean someone who's reckless. Okay, who you know, I roll with, roll with that person once, and they're reckless in terms of um, if you need, if you need to, you know, you want to dominate. Okay, you know, you could dominate a position, and then there's like excessive force. Okay excessive force you know where it's like they're they're trying to just absolutely crush you and and this is a six minute round seven minute round five minute round in class and you can tell that they're just like going way above and beyond um they're da that's dangerous in my opinion and um you know i've i've asked around about this and and you know um some of the things i get are um, well, you know, the, you've got to use technique to defeat that. Um, but there's also, and I've had people also mention, you know, because they would roll with this uh, this kind of person right after me, and they would even tell me, hey, you know, um, like that person rolls like that, they're actually hurting people. They're hurting people um, in, in class. Um, so... You know, um, I get it. You know, there's there's a time and place for that. Um, and, and, you know. This is part of the role of the instructor, though, Noah. I go back to the instructor. In my opinion, it's the even Even if you have an academy where they say, okay, time's up. Find a new one-minute rest. Find a new partner. The instructor should be paying attention of who's rolling with who. What's the quality of that role? Not just what are you doing technically. You know, but they should be paying attention to who who's being too rough on who, you know, who's a high risk to hurt somebody. These are things an instructor should be watching for in their academy. Absolutely. So, so the instructor should sometimes be like, you know, uh, you know, e even just thinking of like, find somebody, whatever, like maybe even go up to someone and say, you know, hey you were being really rough with so-and-so. Can you not use as much power? They're 80 pounds lighter than you, whatever, right? Again, this is the instructor knowing the athletes because there are some smaller athletes that will destroy a guy 100 pounds heavier who's using all his power. And the guy could say to Co coach, I'm using all my power because I'm going against Rafael Mendez or I'm going against Mikey Musumeci, in which case the instructor would be like, okay, I get it. Yeah, keep using all your power, right? Like, but, but, the, the, the instructor does bear a lot of responsibility for if there's mismatches, if there's, you know, you can look around sometimes and think, you know, let me give you an example. When you're an instructor and you're watching the class, you can look over and see two guys rolling and be like, somebody's going to get hurt. Even if it's just that they're, 
that they're they're at, they're going after each other too hot and heavy, and maybe they're going to tackle one or the other on top of other. You know how you see people that are getting wild and they're encroaching on other people's areas, and they're going to follow them, right? They're just going to one guy's so intent to get the takedown that he doesn't care that there's two people rolling behind him, and and he, and he could and that you could fall on top of them and squash them and hurt them. So the instructor has to be mindful of. How are people even using the space? Is that role getting a little bit out of hand? Those things happen, even though we have a great environment. You know, most academies are doing a great job, and most of the egos are pretty well managed and controlled, even though there's a lot of big egos, but people do a really good job of controlling them for the sake of the environment. Um, but it's still the instructor's responsibility to be looking around and be aware of like, hey, guys, 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 easier. Listen, Noah, I've seen, I remember, um, Vitor Belfort, you know, Vitor Belfort trained a lot where I trained with Drysdale and I know Vitor from Randy Couture's. I've been to Vitor's house to interview him. I've thrown the football with Devi, his kid who just got a division. He's getting division one football offers to be quarterback. Mm. And I remember one time, I think it was Gilbert Burns and another guy who was on the ultimate fighter. I forget his name, but Gilbert Burns, who's phenomenal, who's getting, who's in, in line to fight for the 170 pound world title. I rolled with Gilbert Burns. I got destroyed by Gilbert Burns, by the way. I got just, just destroyed by him. And Gilbert Burns, another guy, like the other guy, like I think it was Gilbert. He tackled Gilbert into the wall and there was a hole, there's a chunk of the wall, like a big chunk of the wall. That's how determined this guy was to get the takedown. They put a hole in the wall, bro. Like, I mean, it was like, whoa, you know? And, and then Robert comes there and he's like, what happened to the wall, right? There's like a crater in the wall and like a bit, I'm talking like, I'm not talking about a dent. I'm talking about a hole where like a lot of that wall is not there anymore, right? Like you seriously, so I mean, even in these great training environments, you're still dealing with competitive personalities and things can happen. So at the end of the day, you know, hopefully you train somewhere where the instructor is paying attention and looking and looking for mismatches and looking at places where, hey, somebody could get hurt if this, and maybe they take somebody aside and say, hey, bro, like, just a heads up, man, you got guys around you. Can you guys kind of stay in your area? And can you maybe, you know, I want you, I love you guys being competitive, but, but, you know, can you tone it down a little? Because it, I mean, I, I, I have seen it. I've been doing this a long time. And I have seen it where it's like, wow, that's escalating over there. It's rare, but I've seen it. And, and, and at the end of the day, imagine this, Noah, you're going to be a black belt someday. That's your goal. I believe you're going to make it. That's really important to you. And you haven't stopped. I mean, you still watch a lot of video. You still, you know, we do privates together. You'll be going back to New York. One day you're going to be a black belt, right? Maybe you'll even teach students. And when the student gets hurt, the natural thing as an instructor to think is, is there something I could have done to prevent that? Is there something that's been happening and brewing in my academy where I could have, where I could have went over something with my students and told them, told them about how to tap better or whatever, or went over to a guy and said, hey, bro, like, yeah. use a little more power. Is there any good instructor who really, truly cares about their student is going to think in the same way you would. Think about this. If you were a parent and your kid got seriously hurt in jiu-jitsu, like a knee surgery or whatever, you would be thinking, well, is there a way we could have prevented it? You would. You would oh, yeah. Would oh, yeah. Was that oh, yeah. And, and, and the instructor should have the same care and the same regard for you, just like if you were their kid and think, okay, let me see if I can prevent something like this in the future. Is there something I can say to address the class? Is there something I can teach them? Is there something I can do by going up to someone who might be a little wild? What can I do to, mm -hmm. to create an environment where we're all getting better, but we're using discretion and we're mindful of how much brute force or how wild we are? What can I do? And that is the instructor's job and the instructors need to, need to do their very best. And, and quite frankly, quite frankly, a lot of instructors are very lazy about that responsibility. Not all, but many are very lazy about that responsibility. Oh, I know from my experience, observation of at Henzo's, um, they will they'll give verbal warnings. Good. Um, it, it'll either be a one-off, you don't know about it, private, or uh, you, you know, a private conversation, or you know, a, um, especially every time someone does have to leave the mat from an injury, they'll make a blanket broadcast statement. 
Well, hey, Frank, yeah. we're, 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 we're just hitting it is now uh, uh, already three o'clock uh, Pacific. Um, we, we hit that, we hit that buzzer already. So I want to, um, want to thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, and the opportunity yet again, um, um, to, to have a conversation, um, about these subjects. Um, but also to say adios to, uh, to 2020, um, and let's sign off with, the uh, you know, this is right, right. Today's a, I've lost track of my days sometimes. So, so yeah, well, as far as our regular scheduled, we'll be in the new year um, for the next one um, on our, on our regular scheduled podcast. And I'm looking forward to saying 2021. Here we come. It's been a, it's been a, uh, a, a very, let's just say it's been a, it's, a, it's been a year full of growth, a year full of some really valuable lessons, a year to be grateful a year full of growth, um, a, a year full of taking chances, a year full of adapting. This yeah. year has been about adaptation. It's been about being grateful. Like some people have said, if you if, if you haven't learned to hustle this year, you, then the hustler blood isn't in you. If you're not hustling this year, then you don't have it in you. But That's this right. has been a year with, with, to me, a lot a lot more good than bad. This has been a year where we planted seeds. And uh, here we are, Noah. We said we were going to do it. We did it right where we started, right where we are. We just said, look, these are the resources we have available to us. We start small, but let's let's just make a committed decision. We stuck to it. So here we are. Um, I, I'm, I'll be calling you. Happy New Year to everybody out there. We're going to be a couple of days away. But in the meantime, we hope Noah and I hope you have a happy New Year. And we hope that you uh, join us in 2021 as we continue to expand and grow and 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 reach a bigger audience and like i said our pledge our aim is we're going to be the influencer to the influencer so we're, we're not we're not going to follow the trends we're going to set the trends thank you frank thank you so much noah have a great rest of the day all right you take care bye